Father, I thank you that Jesus is magnificent. I have, Lord, the easiest job in the universe, that is to make you look good. I don't have to do much. But I pray, Lord, as your word goes forth, that you would open both our eyes and our heart to see more of you. Lord, I pray that we would be open and that our ground would be prepared for you. In your wonderful name, amen. Amen. We uh, will begin today, uh, we won't spend much time in there, but we will begin today our journey through the epistle of 1 Peter. And uh, I, I remember a theologian once saying that we should all find a Bible character that we identify with because somewhere along the line you will identify with somebody uh, within Scripture. And if there's anybody that I personally identify with, it's Peter. Uh, you will see as time goes on that Peter had a habit, not of having foot in mouth disease, he was very clever at getting both in at the same time. Uh, we see that he, he was overconfident many times and uh, he needed the Lord to level him. But uh, we also see that Peter had a great heart for Jesus. And today I want to focus on the first six words of the epistle of Peter, where he says that he is Peter, the apostle of Jesus Christ. And the fact that Peter reaches those six words, something amazing has happened in the life of Peter. And I want to have a look at that today. Uh, Most people may or may not know what that is on the screen. That there is a mayfly nymph. And if you are in Tasmania and you are a fly fisherman, you know the full, utter scientific name, process and everything of this insect. This is the number one dietary uh, uh, thing that the trout feed on. You will, you will become an entomologist if you're a fly fisherman in, in Tasmania because you will need to know everything that happens with this little insect. But this little insect amazes me because uh, although we start off with a nymph that lives in the water, feeding on vegetation, if we can have the next slide please, Karen, we end up with, uh, through a process of events, doesn't want to change. Yes, it does. We end up with this. This is called a dun. And this is the adult version of the mayfly. And this is where uh, the trout really come up and sip them off the top. These, these little guys float on top of the water like, a, like little sailboats. And, uh, you know, if you're a naturalist or an evolutionist of any kind, I have to ask you the question, why? <laughs> it... it In all aspects with the caterpillar, why the butterfly? In in all the aspects of of these kinds of things, I believe that God paints us a beautiful picture of of what what happens and what can happen in our lives. It's a process of transformation. You see, that done there, from that nymph, the whole time has the fullest capacity in DNA of that adult mayfly, the whole time it's in the water. And there's a process that it undergoes where it breaks from one realm into another realm. And you cannot look at that and see any part of the nymph. And I believe that God would like to do that in each and every one of our lives. I believe that that's exactly what happened in the life of Peter the Apostle. And I want to ask you this morning, is it possible for lasting, substantial, supernatural transformation to occur in our lives? Is that actually possible or are we destined like the Israelites in the wilderness to go round and round the mountain fighting the same old battles time and time again? Uh, I am a huge fan of David Attenborough. I deliberately pronounce that with the bro on the end. Uh, He is a a naturalist and an evolutionist, but he's also the greatest apologist for the Christian faith. You spend any time uh, looking at this guy's documentaries, you will come to the conclusion somebody magnificent is behind all of this. But I I remember just watching a fleeting, uh, these things amaze me, uh, watching a fleeting documentary on these mountain goats in, in America. These guys uh, live their whole life with four feet on a ledge on the edge of a cliff about as wide as my finger. About as wide as my finger. That's amazing. And I'm thinking, why on earth would you want to spend the entirety of your life on the edge of a cliff where one slip and you are goat spaghetti at the bottom of the cliff? Why would you do that? And I realised that these guys get up off the ground and they hurtle across, they leap from one ledge that big to the next with, without a second thought. But that is the safest place for them to be. Because all their predators wait for them to come down off the cliff. 
so that they can attack them. You know, we look at the lives of people like Peter the Apostle and, and we look at lives like, oh, you know, Smith Wigglesworth and the Wesley brothers and we think that's just a special breed of people that, you know, God did something special in them. That's not for all of us. The reason I love the biography of Smith Wigglesworth is it is absolutely for all of us. He's a guy that learned to read, uh, taught by his wife, learned to read on the Bible. And the difference between sometimes these guys and us is, like these goats, they jump up off the ground and they live their life on the edge of this cliff. And who knows that on the edge of the cliff where you have to get four feet on that space, it's not always comfortable. But God desires us to live our lives on the edge of the cliff. I want to start today by asking the question about transformation. You know, uh, thanks be to my daughter, who's a personal trainer. Uh, she uh, rummaged me along to a gym, and these, this gym does these eight-week transformations. Um, you know, you, you undergo eight weeks, you, you, you've got to, you know, you've got to live on grass for eight weeks, and <laughs> you know how it is, you know, grass and a bit of sawdust, and, and, and of course, kale, brother, over there, you have to eat a, a lot of kale. But for eight weeks, you have to submit to a process, and they tell you that if you submit to this process, then uh, you will be transformed. And you know what? It actually works. Uh, I, see, I have seen people, and I take my hat off to them, I have seen people walk into this gym, and they're out of breath by the time they get to the top of the stairs when they first get there. A bit like me now. But over a process of eight weeks, something changes. They can lift more weight than they used to be able to. Man, it is a full-time job keeping up with some of the girls in that gym, Rob, is it not? It is. A, these girls can lift like a... Ah, they can lift a house. Okay, so uh, steer clear of the girls because they can lift. But they undergo a transformation. The sad thing is for some of them, they undergo these transformations because they relapse and they relapse. And it could be the same in their lives as well. But it wasn't it wasn't really the case for Paul. You know, Paul writes in Romans, and these are my favourite two verses that Paul writes. In chapter 12 uh, of, of Romans, he makes an appeal to transformation. He, it was, you see, we see the word transform in the New Testament three times. The first one is in this, uh, no, not the first one, sorry, but one of them is in these verses where we, hear the, we see the word transform. The Greek is metamorpho or metamorphosis which is what happens to this done here. A complete and utter radical transformation. Uh, but uh, the other place we see it is in 2 Corinthians 3.18, and we'll get to that one at the end. But uh, the other place we see it, of course, is at the Mount of Transfiguration. And that word where they say Jesus was transfigured before them, that is the word metamorpho again, undergoing a complete radical uh, a change in appearance. Jesus was not the Jesus that they had seen and beheld before that mount. And Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. He's going to appeal to a transformation. He says, I appeal to you by the mercies of God. And if you could sum up the book of Romans in one word, it would be gospel. You know, so many times we, we, we get the misconception that we start off with the basic things of the gospel, then we move into the deep and profound things. Can I tell you today, the gospel is the deepest and profound thing of God. It is all of Genesis to Revelation. It is all of the person of Jesus Christ. We don't move on to the deep things of God. The gospel is the deep thing of God. Paul got it. Paul got that. And he says, I appeal to you by the mercies of God. He's highlighted just how far short we all fall. He's, he's, he's gone through what, what faith in Jesus Christ looks like. He's, he's explained that God hasn't forgotten the Israelites. In fact, he's bringing fulfillment to the covenant. And then he says, look, in light of all this wonderful mercy, I make an appeal that you would change your life. Hmm. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable God, which is your spiritual act of worship. And can I tell you that the verb in that process is the word present. You see, we think the gospel is you just sit back and God waves a magic wand and everything just happens. We've got to get up. We're going to make some action. And the verb is that Paul wants to say is your response to the wonderful mercy of God and your response to this beautiful gospel is that you would present everything that you are to him. But how many of us get on and off that altar? 
How many of us jump on there on Sunday and then by Wednesday it's like, okay, I'm hopping off? Well, too often it's most of us. Paul says there's a response in our spiritual worship or our reasonable service could also be, or rational service could also be translated there. It says, uh, I love the words, I can't pronounce this guy's name, he's a first century Stoic philosopher, it's Epictetus, I think, and he says this, he says, if I were a nightingale, I would do what is proper for a nightingale. He says, if I were a swan, then what is proper for a swan, but in fact, I am, the Greek word is logikos, I am a reasonable and I am a rational being, so therefore, I will praise God. It is just rational. In fact, Scripture tells us if we will not praise God, then the rocks and the stones will cry out. The gospel, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of the Messiah. This is this gospel grabbing traction in our lives. This is where the gospel begins to permeate your attitudes. This is where the gospel begins to permeate your speech and your words. It's, it's about, we don't go to football games on Sunday because it's more important to worship God on Sundays. It's, so it's about what we do with our bodies. It's, we, we value people as much as God does. So I don't want to speak that way about people. The gospel permeates our attitude so far as we don't care what colour your skin is, we don't care what country you are from, take our hands and let us worship God together. That's a picture of heaven. John saw heaven and he said, I see every nation and tribe. Yes, he did. Even Collingwood supporters. (laughs) Had to throw that one in there. Verse 2 says, and we're now going to begin to see what this looks like. Verse 2 says, do not conform to this world. And can I tell you that you will be formed and you will be moulded by someone or something. And it's usually what captures our focus and our attention. We'll get to that at the end. But you will be conformed to something. What Peter is saying is spiritual worship and living sacrifice looks like you're no longer allowing the world to mould you. Appreciated Stu's word last week. But it's all about uh, do we allow the world and our culture to tell us when life actually begins? Should we allow our culture and the world around us to tell us what marriage actually is? Paul is saying that your whole life should be conformed, not to the pattern of this world, and here's the contrast, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Here's another one for the evolutionists and the naturalists. Please explain the chameleon. Please explain an animal that was able to evolve a thin layer of crystals at the edge of its skin that it can control by its body temperature. But you see, the idea of a chameleon is that I will do whatever I have to do to make my outside uh, look like everything else around me. And we need, there's no place in the kingdom of God for Christian chameleons. We should be those who stand out. That's what the transformed life looks like. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That's not, let's go and get brainwashed or anything like that, but it's exactly what Stu said last week. When, when we take the lens of the gospel and we apply them to our eyes, it will change the way we live our life. It will transform you from the inside out. It will change the direction of your life. It will change how you view other people. It will change how you view yourself. And here's the most important thing. It changes the way you view God. Because you're looking through a different lens. A couple of weeks ago, I wrote in the newsletter about Polaroids. Uh, You know, fly fishing, you can come to a lake on a sunny day and you can look at the surface and you can't see a thing. It's like, I can't see anything. And you can't go fishing without Polaroids because the minute you put the Polaroids on, you're able to see right into the water and see everything that's going on. But the thing is, that stuff was already, already, it was always there. It's not like you put the glasses on and all of a sudden fish jump out in front of you, no. They're always there, but you can't see them. And when you put the lens of the gospel on, you go, oh, I see God in everything. He's always there. Peter the Apostle got this. Paul the Apostle gets this. Karl Barth said that the Christian life 
is the great disturbance. It should absolutely, categorically rock the status quo around us, the lives that we live. And I wonder what would happen if a hundred plus people that are sitting in this room today said, you know what, Lord, I want to be like those goats and I want to jump up off the ground and I want to live life on the ledge. I wonder what would happen. Well, if you read the book of Acts, I'll tell you what happened with 11 men that said, let's do that. And 11 men soon turned into 120 in the upper room. They said, you know what, we're just going to jump up on the ledge for a while. You see, the ledge is a place where you have to lose control. God has a way of taking control. Let's have a look at Peter the Apostle. <clears throat> Make your way, please, to Luke chapter 22. I'll give you a quick biography. Peter the Apostle, he writes that he is the Apostle <clears throat> of Jesus Christ in the first epistle. In the second one, he will say that he is the uh, servant or the bond servant of Jesus Christ. James, the half-brother of Jesus, will say that he's a bondservant. What's the difference? A bondservant, <clears throat> uh, particularly under Hebrew law in the Old Testament, a bondservant would come to the point where they were released. You've done your service. You no longer have to be a slave to this person. And a bondservant puts their hand up and says, you know what, I like it so much here now that I'm not here because I have to be. I'm here because I want to be. And, you know, Peter's come to the point in his life where he says, you know what, I don't serve Jesus Christ because I have to. I serve Jesus Christ because I want to. I'm not on this altar because God has shackled me to this living sacrifice altar. I'm on this altar because I willingly lay myself down. He's an apostle and a bond servant of Jesus Christ. We're going to see that as we work our way through this epistle, that, that God will use the wells that he's dug. You know, God digs wells in our lives that he fills up all so that it can be emptied for the benefit of other people. Peter the disciple, we will see uh, as we move on, Peter the disciple uh, experiences much at the hands of Christ. Something amazing happens in John chapter 1, verse 42. Jesus, uh, Peter is introduced to Jesus by his brother Andrew. And as Peter is coming, uh, Jesus says, Simon, son of John, you will be called Peter. And today, uh, names, apart from mine, of course, names may not mean as much as they did in the first century, but <clears throat> for, in the first century, names were huge. Your whole identity was wrapped up in your name. When Jesus said, you are Simon, son of John, they knew that it was son of John, the fisherman from Galilee. So he was obviously from Galilee. He was obviously a fisherman. They could trace your whole heritage and identity. And what Jesus is saying to Peter is, that's all well and good, but you're going to have a new identity. You're not going to be Simon, son of John anymore, but there's a process that Peter will undergo before he becomes Peter the Apostle. It's a process that is uncomfortable. Uh, how many people here are aware of, who, if I said Andrew G, how many people here know who Andrew G is? And all the millennials went, yo, yeah, most, you're a millennial, Dom, we know that. So Andrew G uh, is on television. He's a well-known celebrity, uh, but he actually had a meltdown. Too many drugs and too much partying, uh, and he had some serious episodes with psychosis. He's actually written a book about it now, back after the break, which is talking about his mental break. Anyway, uh, long story short, he meets some Buddhist guy, but uh, the profound thing was this guy gave him the advice. He said, you know what? Uh, go back and change your name and you'll change your life. And so he did, and now we know him as the guy who hosts The Bachelor as Osha. And I watched a recent interview, <coughs> and his life now is radically different than what it was. And he changed his name, he changed his identity, he changed his life. And there's some people in here this morning, and I'm not referring to your outward name. I'm referring to the name that Jesus is calling some people in here. Too often we, like Peter, and as we will see with Peter, too often we go back to the Simon, son of John. Peter the disciple, uh, the, immediately when he is called, how many of us could do this today? Immediately that Peter is called, he drops his nets and follows Jesus. We forget that, Jesus, uh, that Peter experiences much in his time with Jesus. We forget that Peter becomes to the realisation who Jesus is in the boat, right about the time that he's called. And the nets come in and everybody else in the boat has missed it. But Peter says, get away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. 
Peter recognised who Jesus was, Peter recognises who he is. It is the same Peter that will declare, you are the Christ the Son of God. It is the same Peter that will walk on water. It is the same Peter in John chapter 6. I love this. John chapter 6. Multitudes are following Jesus after he's fed the 5,000. Multitudes follow him. Then he teaches about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And all these other disciples, these hanger honorers go, whoa, this is too much for me. I'm out of here. Jesus turns to his 12 disciples and says, what about you guys? What about you lot? Do you want to go as well? Peter says, what does he say, brother? Where? To whom? Where are we going to go? You've got the words of eternal life. And we have come to know and believe that you are the Son of God. Amen. So don't think for a moment that Peter wasn't convinced of who Jesus was. Don't think for a moment before we get to Luke chapter 22 here. Don't think for a moment that he hadn't experienced Jesus. Don't think for a moment that he wasn't fully aware. And then, Peter say, then Jesus says to Peter, chapter 22, verse 31, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift, sift, sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. See what Jesus prays? If Jesus didn't pray that he would be removed from this trial, no. Jesus didn't pray that uh, anything apart from this, whatever happens to you, Peter, my prayer is that your faith will remain. Wow. I have prayed for you that uh, your faith will not fail. And when you have, when, I love that. Not if, but when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. And we all know what happens. Let us, let us turn to uh, verse 54. It says, Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. That is Jesus. And Peter was following at a distance. And too many of us are following Jesus at a distance. Too many of us. What, what made Peter hang back? Peter was afraid. Peter was afraid that he would become embroiled. It would be, life was cheap. The Romans would crucify you uh, for, for no reason at all if they had to, just to make a point. There was no, no qualms about it at all. Peter, you could just as likely be crucified. He was afraid, so he followed at a distance. He was afraid that the same would happen to him. But the one thing that's happening in Peter's life right now is, I am losing control. Jesus, don't you talk about dying. Don't you talk about going away, because I can't handle that. While things are like this, I can control things. And Peter's following in a distance to see what will happen. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, this man also was with him. But he denied it. And the Greek there is a very strong form of denied. It is an adamant Denial. It is, a, uh, it is a strong and forceful denial of having any connection with. And sometimes, you know, we beat Peter up. But how many of us do the same by the words that we speak? How, how often do we come to the same point with the actions and the attitudes that we hold? That we deny any connection. But he denied it saying, woman, I do not know him. He goes on to deny it very forcefully. Some translations, you know, every gospel, uh, every gospel mentions the denial of Peter. It's interesting. But some say that he swears, something you should not do. And then we come down to the point where he says for the third time, man, I do not know what you were talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. Can I tell you that the most important part of Peter's life, the turning point in Peter's life, was not Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. The turning point was not when Jesus called him. The turning point in the life of Peter is when the rooster crowed. Because it was at that point, after following Jesus for a period of time, that Peter realised, I haven't got it all together. He's just told Jesus that even if I have to die with you, I would never deny you, Jesus. And he's just realised... I was wrong. 
it is the Gospel of Luke that records this last part. And put yourself in Peter's part, in Peter's uh, shoes here for a moment. While he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And verse 61 tells us, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Jesus didn't say a word. Who knows Jesus didn't have to say anything. Every married man in this room said amen. (laughs) Brothers, we know that our lovely wives can look at us and speak a thousand words. I can say that because my lovely wife is children's church. I checked the roster. But how many people know that Peter didn't need Jesus to say anything? But how many people have been right where Peter's at right now? How many people know that Jesus comes and he puts his finger on something in your life and you know that he doesn't have to say a word? He might put a finger on an attitude. He might put a finger on what it is that you're holding back. It might even be that God's putting his finger on your life saying it's time for you, just like those goats, it's time to get off the ground. It goes on to say that Peter wept bitterly. It's a great sign of repentance because Peter knew that he'd made a mistake. I want to move now quickly to John chapter 21 as we work towards a conclusion this morning. And I love this part because it's the restoration of Peter. And I want to paint the background here because Jesus has been crucified, but praise be to our Lord and Saviour, he has been raised from the dead due to a sinless life by the power of God. And he appears to the disciples and uh, he, he appears to them on the shores while they're fishing. You see, Peter, he, he doesn't know what to do now. Jesus, has, uh, Jesus is dead. He's, he, he, he hasn't seen him yet. But, you know, what precedes this is, and I love this, uh, the Gospel of Mark is written by John Mark, but it is highly attested in theological circles that it was orated by Peter. And it is the Gospel of Mark in chapter 16 when the angel is speaking to the women and says, go and tell the disciples and Peter. (laughs) What? That's scandal. These disciples, I mean, uh, they're a ramshackled bunch. You know, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter's following at a distance. John's the only one that ends up in the courtyard. One flees naked. We learnt that on Wednesday night. (laughs) Seriously. But it's just like Jesus. If you want to know who God is going to use mightily, pick the most unlikely person in this room. God will always use the most unlikely person. Why, Jesus, would you pick Peter? Why wouldn't you go to the temple? Why wouldn't you go to the high priest? Oh, there's some good reasons why. But he takes Peter. And this Peter says, I'm going fishing. That's what happens. He says, who knows that all of the most holiest men of Scripture fished? And Peter says, I'm going fishing. And then, you know, they don't catch anything. And then here's this weird guy with long hair on the shore again. And he says, let your nets down. And then they they haul in so much fish, John turns around and says, it is the Lord. You need to understand something about fishermen in the first century. They often fished naked. So praise God when it clarifies that Peter put on his clothes and, and jumped out of the boat and ran towards Jesus. And Peter's running towards Jesus. And Jesus has prepared breakfast and and they sit down and have breakfast. And then it says, and when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon, Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? What happened to Peter? You see, Jesus is going to begin to expose the heart of Peter. So many people point to the fact that You know, maybe more than these is more than the disciples. Peter didn't show any extraordinary love for the disciples. What Jesus is pointing to, the context that the scripture gives us is, do you love me more than these, than the fish, than the fishing? Do you love me more than this Simon, son of John? You see, the whole time in the wilderness, the Israelites pined for Egypt. So often. Why? Egypt felt safe. Felt like we were in control. Can I tell you that there is a battle in the universe that rages today? And the battle is for our lives and the battleground is our heart and God is fighting every one of us in that battleground. That's the battle that's raging and that's what's going on here with Peter. And God says, I'm going to claim some territory today. 
Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? It's profound what Jesus says, but isn't it profound what he does not say? I know if I was Peter, it would be rattling around in my mind. When's he going to get to the denial? Jesus makes no mention of it. Not once. Who knows that if I was Jesus, or if most of us were Jesus, it would have been the first thing we would have said. I told you so. Jesus doesn't say a word. And maybe we should be more like Jesus and forget about our weaknesses. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to him, Simon, <coughs> to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus will go on and ask him three times whether he loves him. And the whole time, every time Jesus says, you either feed my lambs, you either feed my sheep, or you tend my sheep. What is Jesus saying? Do you love me, Peter? Yes, of course, Lord, I love you. Then get off the ground and get up on the cliff face. That's where I've called you to be, Peter. I've called you to be up on the cliff face. You're going to have to lose control, Peter. I'm going to have to take control. I'm going to have to be the one that governs your heart, your affections and your desires. I'm the one that has to have control. But if there's going to be any transformation, Peter, we have to leave Simon, son of John, behind. Who knows... Peter finishes his race better than he starts. Before we get to the end of the epistle, let me tell you how Peter's life ends. Peter will be crucified upside down under the reign of Nero. He will <coughs> spend much of his time in prison. He will... Uh, I'll just turn to 2 Corinthians 3.18 if you want to meet me there to finish off. He will be crucified upside down at his request. Nero brings him out to be crucified. Paul has been beheaded. Some historians attest because Peter is married. And some will say that his wife was executed beforehand. Jesus says to Peter at the conclusion of John chapter 21, he says, that you've done what you've wanted to do, Peter. Up until now, you've lived the life, basically my paraphrase, you've lived the life you've wanted to. You've gone where you've wanted to. You've done whatever you want. There will be a time, Peter, when you will be taken where you don't want to go and they will stretch out your hands and that's exactly what happened to Peter. And John says, Jesus said this to specify the kind of death that Peter would die to glorify God. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, And we all with unveiled face, beholding, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed, metamorphosis, metamorpho, we are being transformed into the same image. And I want to ask you today who it is or what it is that has your focus and what it is or who it is that has your attention. Because... We will be moulded and we will be conformed and we will be fashioned into the likeness of what it is or more importantly, who it is that has our focus. What's the answer for transformation? Change what it is that you behold. People will say, look at the transformation in Peter. Look at him in Acts chapter 2. And I, I get that. But I think the biggest transformation in Peter is found in Acts chapter 12. You see, what happens is Herod kills James, not the half-brother of Jesus, the other James with the sword. It pleases the crowd so much, he seizes Peter. You read Acts chapter 12 when you get home, Peter is put in prison and Herod has determined that he will bring him out tomorrow before the crowds because it pleased them so much. He is set with a Roman guard surrounding the jail. He is put deep into the jail and it says that he is chained, each one each side, to a Roman guard. Who knows, it looks pretty darn impossible. But in a little house on the prairie, no, that's not what it says, but in a little house, some people were praying earnestly, Scripture says, and an angel came and had to do something to Peter. He had to nudge him to wake him up. Who sleeps the night before their execution? 
Who sleeps so soundly the night before their execution that an angel's got to go, oi? Somebody who's got a transformed heart, that's who. You see, Peter was always clambering to try and fix everything. Even on the Mount of Transfiguration. Let me put up some tents. Something deep had been transformed inside of Peter where he says, you know what, God is in control. I've done everything I can. If I'm executed tomorrow, I'll meet Jesus. If not, I carry on the work that he's given me. And he's sound asleep. I'm going to ask Stu if he can come back and play. This morning we're going to finish with a song and if you need prayer, then myself and the elders are available to pray with you. But let us sing this morning. I want to leave a challenge with you this morning about who it is that we behold. Who is the most important one in our lives? Who captures our focus and our attention? <clears throat> is <clears throat> Jesus the one that captures all of our focus and attention? <clears throat> We're going to sing Creating Me a Clean Heart, Stu? Yeah. Awesome. Let us stand together as I finish in prayer. <clears throat> Father, I thank you that transformation is possible. We are fully reliant upon you, O oh God, and for that we come and we surrender our lives and we present our lives to you this morning. And we ask, Lord, that you would fill us. Lord, that you would sift us. creating us a clean heart. The, the Hebrew word for create is bra. It means to form something from, what is not, is, from what's not there. We need God to, to create a heart that is clean inside of us. Just like Peter did. Peter, the apostle of Jesus Christ. Let us sing together this morning. Father, we glorify your wonderful name this morning. And we ask, Lord, that you would take our surrendered lives and hearts in your glorious name. Amen.